Welcome, everybody. I'm going, to, I'm going to introduce the course again because it will help everybody. It will help the people who were here last time and the people who are here for the first time. It will help me, too. And, uh, you know, this course, I don't know if I emphasize this. Th this course is designed for the interested public. It's supposed to be uh, a way of getting ready for the bicentenary. That, the, and the bicentenary for Baha'is means uh, the bicentenary of the birth of the founder of Baha'u'llah. So I'm going to try to I'm going to try to talk through this course as if no one here was a Baha'i. The truth is most of you are, but some some we have a few friends. Like I know him from another course like this downtown. Uh, so this course is. Uh, to, to introduce the Baha'i faith through its founders, but emphasizing storylines. I'm not, I'm not saying this is the only way to introduce the Baha'i faith. It, it's a new way for me, and so I'm emphasizing it. I'm also aware that uh, other religions have what could be called a gospel or a short a story of good news, a story of good news. For example, uh, Christian children learn to talk about... Uh, the storylines of Jesus. They, they learn about Jesus when he was 12 years old. He's in the temple talking to rabbis. And they learn, you know, he, he selects a fisherman to follow him. And so these are distinct storylines. They're like headings, you know, of, of, a, of, of a, an article. So I'm trying to think like a journalist. You know, how would an open-minded journalist approach the Baha'i faith uh, to learn about it and to... and with you know, to learn about it fairly and to enter into the point of view of uh, the followers of that, of that faith, the Baha'i faith. Okay, um, here's another thing I believe. I believe it's not easy to introduce the Baha'i faith. Some may think it's easy. The reason I think it's difficult is because it's a relatively new religion. There's more revelation. There are more books. Um... It's also not easy because we have the presence of other major world religions all around us. Mm -hmm. Not just one other religion, like a, perhaps an older religion was competing with one other religion, or now there's many. Another reason it's difficult is many people are completely skeptical about religion. They think religion has done a lot of harm, you know, and, and the abuse of religion definitely has done a lot of harm. So to introduce the Baha'i faith as something that came from God through prophets and has a book, this is, it's not easy to introduce uh, you know, the general public, I don't think. That's, maybe it is easy and I just haven't learned how to do it yet. So I'm experimenting and inviting people to prepare for the bicentenary by looking at the story of the two founders, the Bab and Baha'u'llah, mostly Baha'u'llah. I also wanted to mention these books. Like this is the book called Release the Sun. And uh, this was written by William Sears, who was a journalist, also a hand of the cause in the Baha'i faith, but a journalist. So I'm specifically looking for how journalists tell the story because journalists have a way of uh, being succinct and trying to capture your attention and move in a kind of a way, uh, a logical way. So this is called Release the Sun, and this is the story of the Bob. Um, here's a story called, this is a book called The Story of Baha'u'llah. I don't know if I mentioned this last time. The woman that wrote this, the subtitle, The Promised One of All Ages, she wrote this like a novel. She tried to uh, learn enough about the details of the situation that the... the uh, that Baha'u'llah was in with his family, and even the smells in the marketplace where they were. And she did extra research on the women and tried to flesh out. So there's 69 little stories in here. I like that, little stories. That's exactly what I'm trying to learn, you know, storylines or short stories. 69 stories that are about four or five pages long. Um, in this course, I'm going to try to break up the story of Baha'u'llah into 25 storylines. I'm sorry, who was the author? Uh, oh, Drew, her name is Drusel. You know, she's, the handout I used last week, it lists this book. It, it, but Drusel, D-R-U-Z-E-L-L-E, -E, Cedarquist, C-E-D-E-R-Q-U-I-S-T. 
Um, here's another book. This one's called The Prisoner and the Kings. So this is by William Sears again, and a journalist. And what he's talking about is uh, Baha'u'llah's letters to the great powers of the day. And, uh, you know, what he said to them, basically, and how they received it, and some of the historical consequences of their mostly rejection of, of what he said. So this is a very interesting, dramatic portrayal of a history from about uh, 1868 until about until World War One. So it's showing what happened in the world, uh, how how world leaders responded to uh, Baha'u'llah, Baha the prisoner and the kings. Right? And another, see, journalists are not trying to impress you with fancy language; they're just trying to convey things that happen. So that's what I'm looking for. A sort of you could say it's a not not a scholarly approach. It's just trying to convey what happened, the, the story. Okay, uh, what else do I want to tell you? Um, so last week, I introduced the Baha'i Faith. I had just one page of basic things about the Baha'i Faith, the emphasis on unity, unity of humanity, religion, God. I talked about five levels of reality, and uh, Sharuz mentioned there's a website called Baha'i Cosmology, but five levels mean the natural world, the human world, which includes one foot in the natural world and one foot in a spiritual realm through the conscience or the soul. Uh, we can reflect invisible realities. Higher than that level is the level of the manifestations. The manifestations, that's the Baha'i word for prophets with a capital P, messengers of God, uh, awakened ones, enlightened ones. Okay, so, and then higher than that level, according to this schema, would be the Holy Spirit. But someone raised the question of, uh, aren't the manifestations and the Holy Spirit the same thing? You could look at it that way because they reflect the Holy Spirit perfectly. That's the belief of the followers of those manifestations or prophets. So we, don't, we wouldn't know about the Holy Spirit except through the manifestations. That's the Baha'i belief. And then even higher than that level, would be ultimate reality or God or the, uh, the great unknown, the unknowable essence. What I think I discovered when I was studying world religions is that the different religions name these levels differently. And so you could think they're talking about different things, but I think it's very similar if you study the essence of their terms. Now, for example, in Buddhism, uh, they might use the term celestial Buddha. So that... They're emphasizing this is Buddha in his realm of the manifestation, not his earthly realm, but his, his non-earthly realm, where he was before he came to earth, where he went after he passed from this world. Um, so, okay, I even think there are scientific terms that correspond with some of those levels, but that's a, another class. We won't, we're not going to worry about that. I also gave you a chart that looks something like this. And the chart was trying to demonstrate that uh, history has a pattern from a Baha'i perspective. And the pattern is that uh, uh, great civilizations emerge because of the teachings of founders of religion. And you could list civilizations here, Chinese civilization, Jewish civilization. And then you could put another column right beside them with the founders or the unifiers, so that's a term I'm trying to introduce. We can think of the founders of the religions as unifiers because they unified many tribes or many nations. And um, to add a name to the list of, of, of names that most people recognize, so they might recognize, for example, uh, Moses, and they'll rec they recognize Buddha, and they recognize Jesus, and they recognize Muhammad. So then to say there's another one of these unifiers, revealers of a, of a new civilization that's going to be global. So that's saying that Baha'u'llah is of a station that's similar to what other people recognize. So I'm trying to build a bridge between what people already understand and something new. Um, also in that chart, I mentioned a list of rulers who embraced the new cause 
by the revealer. For example, Constantine, Roman emperor, embraced Christianity, and that put Christianity on the map of history. And before a ruler like that comes along, uh, a religion is not recognized by historians very much. It's, it, it might be recognized as, oh, they're just a little offshoot of some other faith. Christians are an offshoot of Judaism. Until that ruler comes along, uh, historians don't recognize it as a new religion, a new world religion, or a new civilization. So the Baha'i faith doesn't have this ruler yet who unifies all the nations. But that's the belief Baha'is have. There will come someone who brings all the nations together and says, uh, let's, let's, let's make a new world together, consultatively, consulting divine guidance, new divine guidance. I'm calling that figure a convener of nations. Maybe that figure is uh, the universal house of justice. Maybe that figure is one, fig one world ruler who uh, wins the trust of many other world rulers. Okay, and then I had a fourth column, which was the names for the promised day. All the religions that looked forward to a promised day, which would be preceded by a promised one. Uh, so that, and, and I, there were names like great peace and grand unity, Chinese terms, uh, new, <coughs> new golden age, Hindu term, a universal Dharma realm, Buddhist term, new millennium, new heaven, new earth, these are Christian terms, uh, day of resurrection, day of renewal, Islamic terms, and Baha'i terms, world unity and most great peace. Okay, so that's a little bit of review of what I was trying to do last time. Another thing, uh, I, we introduced six storylines for the Bob, the forerunner of Baha'u'llah. And uh, the first one I called A Modern Search for the Holy Grail. Uh, I wanted, it, most people, many people may never heard of Holy Grail. I want to give a, here's a Baha'i term for that. The mystic chalice. Have you heard that phrase before in some Baha'i, the mystic chalice? Mm -hmm. So a chalice is a cup. Mystic, that sort of means a spiritual cup. Uh, of what? Sorry. Omeyun. Yes. Please sit over here. Thank you. Yeah, I can't oh. believe, see, he's from another class too. Oh my God. <laughs> They're sitting next to the teacher? I didn't well, do nothing. Not. <laughs> And it's good. I keep that my eyes. I have to be really quiet. Um, so, Mystic Chalice. So, this is a, a cup of, of divine wisdom, something like that. Okay, so William Sears says uh, first storyline a modern search for the Holy Grail or the Mystic Chalice. Or, here's another way to put it moral spiritual growth for humanity. I think that would be another way to put it. Second storyline millennial expectation. So at the time of the Bab, there was expectation in the Islamic world for a promised one. Uh, in the Christian world as well, in the, and near the end of last class, I talked about in India and China, there was also millennial expectation, which really shocked me when I first learned that. Okay, third, third storyline last week, auspicious birth and childhood for the Bab. Um, this is so important that we have a, a special holy day. We, I mean, Baha'is have a holy day, October 20th, birth of the Bab. Um, so he comes from the family of the Prophet Muhammad, and he has innate knowledge. Then the fourth uh, storyline we looked at was youth and divine commission. The Bab visited holy shrines in Iraq, Karbala, and uh, he felt a divine commission when he saw the head of, the severed head of Imam Hussein. And he had an, a vision that he was going to be a martyr for the cause of God. That was uh, not, and maybe a fairly not, not well-known story about the commissioning, divine commissioning of the Bab. Then we also talked fifth storyline, shaky school. There was a group of scholars that were getting together, Muslim scholars, Shia, and uh, they, they knew the Quran well, they knew the Hadith well, they knew the teachings of the Imams well. And they were realizing, you know, the time of the Promised One is coming. The Promised One of Islam, Baqa'in. The hidden Imam is going to become unhidden. They were starting to believe that because of their study of both 
the, the, the writings and the signs of the times. So they were seeing corruption in, in the world. Okay, so that's the fifth storyline. The sixth one was the de declaration of the Bab to Mullah Hussein. Mullah Hussein was one of those shakis who went out looking and found the Bab in Shiraz. So that's such an important storyline that the Baha'is have a holy day all around that one. The declaration of the Bab. Every year, Baha'is revisit that declaration. It must be important if we go back and look at that year after year after year, along with the birth. Okay, that's all we did last week in terms of storylines. We looked at those six. And today, uh, let's uh, look, this is the handout I've given you today. He's got 12 storylines. And again, I'm not saying this is the only way to teach or to understand or talk about the Baha'i faith, but it's, it's a good way, I think. It's a good way. Other ways include through music, songs, through studying prayers, through devotions, through uh, Ruhi books. These are ways too, firesides, through scholarly works, all, all kinds of ways. How about videos? There's a lot of ways to do it. Um, I'm, in, I'm very fascinated by this storyline idea because, and it was inspired by the bicentenary coming. So for a year I've been aware, oh, we're going to have a bicentenary of the founder of the Baha'i Faith. How are we going to explain uh, the founder of the Baha'i Faith to the world at large? What do, you, what, do you, what do you say about someone whose name is hard to pronounce? What impact... Uh, did he have over 200 years? So that's what got me thinking about uh, being like a journalist. How would you describe it if you're a journalist who's eager to learn? Because of all the bad news, you know, that we hear, I'm thinking like a journalist these days. Ha, you know, what a problem to make sense out of this very complex world. But I think most journalists are very good. That is, they're trying to get at the truth. What would a journalist say about uh, the founders of the Baha'i Faith if he or she were truly trying to be objective and fair and willing to enter into the frame of reference of uh, Baha'is, and early Babis, followers of the Baha'i? Okay, um, so that's enough of summarizing last week what we were trying to do. And uh, I gave you eight pages last week. You know, it might be very confusing. Not all of those pages are equally important. I'm emphasizing the storylines. Same thing today. There's going to be 12 storylines. That's going to be the center of what I'd like us to do. But there's other pages too, and we might look at some of them. Because, for example, Tahereh, she's in one of those storylines called the Conference of Badasht. And Tahereh is so fascinating to the modern person because she's a woman and because she was so eloquent and so wise and so courageous and she's a marking post, an historical marking post. So we might look a little bit extra at her. Um, so I'm looking at the, uh, the second handout, which is uh, what you have in front of you. All right. Um, <coughs> So, I want to pick on some of the same readers. Tabasong, you're willing to read. And uh, where's Steve? He's not here. Steve Goldrick. Who's willing to read? Who likes to read in public? You're willing to read? And you're Roya. Tabasong, Roya, and Homeyun. Yes. I know about him from the other class. This, can you believe there's another class just like this with five people in it at the Baha'i Center? And this one has a multitude in downtown 13. Dif different kinds of classes. All right, uh, so those are the three readers. Can you start with the number seven, Tabasong? You, you say it's revelatory? Revelatory writings. Revelatory yeah. writings. The Bob revealed a large body of divine guidance, beginning with the best of stories and interpretation of the story of Joseph foreshadowing how the world would respond to the Bab and Baha'u'llah. Other writings of the Bab included commentaries on the Boron, the Sermon of Remembrance, the Seven Proofs, and the Bayon. 
And of course, the big one there is the bayon. But the point is, uh, so he was, uh, the Bob was, had innate knowledge. He had it as a child, and now he had it after his declaration, and he starts revealing new verses uh, and, and volumes, and uh, they're not even all translated. And, and most Baha'is don't even know what's in them. I don't. So I'm, we're not worried about that. But this is a storyline that he starts revealing verses. He's adding to scripture uh, the guidance from God uh, according to Bobby's. Okay, um, so Roya, can you read number eight there? The Bob's Disciples, Letters of the Living. After Mullah Hussein recognized the Bob's station and cause, it took only a short time for the other 17 Letters of the Living to discern, discern his station by spiritual means, declare their allegiance, and embrace the new faith. The Bob and his disciples spread their cause all over Persia and the number of their followers grew rapidly, anticipating the promised one of all ages and a new day of global unity. So these storylines are designed to remind people who know a lot about this what they know. Because right? some of you can talk for two hours just on this. Right? It's supposed to just be enough to remind you of your ability, your, your capacity to share the story. To people who've never heard this, these, in other words, these disciples have to find the Bob by spiritual discernment. That's amazing. Just by awareness of the higher realms, they find the Bob, and they do so. And he, he gets them all together, and then he sends them all over Persia, warning them this is not going easy an easy job they have. You know they're going to suffer persecution and martyrdom. Okay, um, you can comment on any one of these briefly if you want, but we need to keep moving to keep momentum. Okay, Homayun number nine, if you would. Okay. Early mission of Mullah Hussein, a produce. The Bab gave Mullah Hussein a letter to bring to the beloved in Tehran without revealing his name, a secret hidden, the seat of true sovereignty, Baha'u'llah. When Baha'u'llah received that letter, he immediately recognized the station of the Bab and became one of the leaders of the Bab's cause. The Bab and Fordus went on pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina, where he declared his mission. But there was no recognition or response in those holy cities. In Shiraz, southern Persia, Fordus withstood the most grievous indignation indignities and was expelled from the city. Then the cruel governor summoned the Bab to Shiraz. So there's a lot in this storyline, right? I including uh, sending a letter to Baha'u'llah. You know, it I think this is correct to say Baha'u'llah is not a letter of the living. They've already been selected. Right? This is an extra letter to somebody special. He doesn't even name who it is. Uh, he says, uh, the beloved in Tehran, find him. Spiritual discernment again. A secret hidden, the seat of true sovereignty. My goodness. So Mullah Hussein, one of the main letters of the living, a leader, uh, goes there. And Baha'u'llah immediately recognizes it. And again, you know, the Christian parallel to this would be as if John the Baptist wrote a letter to Jesus. And Jesus gets the letter and say, "Oh, I think I'm going to support. I'm going to support John the Baptist. I'm going to. I'm going to. Going to teach his cause. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? If Jesus would promote the cause of someone who's leading the world to accept Jesus. Wow. Okay. So, uh, I, if you're coming at that from a Western point of view, that's a little bit complicated. <laughs> that. The one who the Bob is getting ready for is helping him. <laughs> I'm just, maybe I just have a weak brain or something, but I, I found that challenging. That, that's interesting and challenging. Okay, Tobasum, can you read 10? How's the rest in Shiraz? The Bob set forth for Shiraz before hearing of the summons, 
befriended his captor and attracted him to the palace. The governor of Shiraz treated the guard with shameful cruelty, placing him under house arrest, but the new faith continued to attract ever larger numbers. After two years of the guard's house arrest, the governor planned to execute the guard, but a plague of cholera brought him to the city, and the guard was expelled. You know, as we go through, I'm not saying this is the only way to see it. I may even be making mistakes. If you see a mistake, please bring it up, of course, or a different way to put it. What I'm doing is, this is experimental. How do you tell this complicated story in, the, in a way that someone who's never heard of it might understand? That's the attempt to, the, the way a journalist thinks. You know, a journalist is afraid you're not going to read the article. So the first sentence of the article in the paper has to be pretty good. <laughs> you know, so in other words, that's what I'm trying to get at. Can you get to a punchline about something that's an important part of the story of the Bob? And there may be way more to it, and you may know. See, for example, the last session is the Abu Baha, the successor to Baha'u'llah and the Guardian. We're going to look at those. And there's a character called Abu Fadl who fascinates me. Now, I'm going to talk about him in relation to Abdul Baha. And I'm going to get carried away because that story just amazes me. Anyway, but that's me. See, different things amaze different people. You're trying to touch on a range of things that will remind you of your own power to tell the story or your own questions about the story. Okay? So, um, 11, Roya, please. Mission in Isfahan. The Baal went to Isfahan, central Persia, in 1846, where the governor, Manjir Khan, a pure-hearted and just man, embraced the Baal's cause, posted him in his own home, and hoped to win the king in Tehran to the cause. The Baal praised the governor of Isfahan, but prophesied that the cause would triumph through the poor and lowly, and that the governor would pass in glory to the next world in three months and nine days. You know, I almost fainted when I read this. Finally, he finds someone, the governor of Isfahan, who, who knows the king really well, and that governor likes the Bob and sees this as a new cause of God that will help the world, and he's so eager to help the Bob then the Bob says, oh, by the way, you're going to die in about three months and nine days. And furthermore, this cause is not going to be promoted from the top down. It's going to be promoted from the bottom up. It's going to go through the poor and the lowly and the downtrodden. The same way other religions have gotten going. That's the way it looks to me. And uh, But I just find this shocking because you get to that and say, oh, wow, finally... A nice governor, not the, like the guy in Shiraz. And this is what he tells him. Hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Now, and incidentally, you know, people who are from the West, they don't know, they've heard of Isfahan, maybe, maybe not. Probably not. And uh, I know one time someone sent me some pictures of Isfahan, and I was just breath. I mean, it, it, you, you learn, it's in Iran, it's in, it's in Iran, that country that's been a kind of problem for the West. And so you might say, there's no one, nothing good over there. But then you see some pictures of Isfahan. It's a shocker, it is so beautiful. There's no one who can see the gardens and mosques in Isfahan and not go like this and back up. Wow, this is a very advanced culture. Because Abbas the Great, you know, set up, well, it was great even long before that too, right? Zoroastrian, way, way back. But anyway, so I just find that an interesting trick. I send some pictures of Isfahan to somebody who's prejudiced against, uh, you know, Shia Islam or, or, please, please. Oh, sorry. You Your hand is up. It is, but I have a question regarding um, the, the house arrest in Shiraz. I was just wondering who the governor was. Because I'm... I was reading the book that you're that you mentioned, the Lisa Sun. And the, yeah. is that the same governor, if I'm not mistaken? Who knows the name of that governor? You see how I'm Because his is it the one where his son was really, really sick and then he asked Oh, that was a different one? Yeah, 
Khan. That was Gurgen Khan. Mm. Who? His name was Gurgen Khan. Khan. That's Gurgen. the one. That's the one we slapped about. Yeah. The one. No. 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 Gurgen Khan was his son. And someone in the Shivas who is talking about that. What was his name? We're gonna stop. Uh, I, I will tell you why. Yeah, Gurgen Khan. I think came after Manjushri. Yes. Yes. After Manjushri. Yes. That's okay. I'm not going to allow esoteric debates. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry I'm ignorant about it, but the, here's the point of this class. The basic storyline is all we're going to worry about. You, you Google all that stuff on your own, read the book, da, da, da. we're not going to go into that. I'm not going to waste any time with it. I'm going to cut it right off and move along because there's a different goal. Anyway, sorry about that. I know that's disappointing, and you, but you'll see my ignorance. I, I'm trying to learn the basics of the story so that I can keep going when I'm talking to someone and not get stuck on some name. You know, it would be nice to know the name. I could add that. You know, my wife could do it. She read the whole Dawnbreakers and seems to have understood it. And she's not Persian. <laughs> she can say all those names. I, I don't know what kind of brain that is that collects. Anyway, okay. It's beyond my capacity. I, the, the, please. I have a question. Have you ever seen how possibly the Bab or Baha'u'llah, in their communications to each other, they have referred to each other? Oh, uh, have I got a deal for you. <laughs> you know, in this book, there's a special chapter just on that. It's about the relationship between the Bab and Baha'u'llah and all their invisible communication and their visible communication, both. <gasps> you know, it's a long chapter, about 30 pages of just that. You see, it, that he calls it that chapter. Uh, I'm not going to get distracted again like this, but that, well, that one's called The Dawn and the Sun. Who's the dawn? The dawn is the Bab, and, and who's the sun is Baha'u'llah. So he calls it The Dawn and the Sun. It's all about their cooperation with each other. Okay. Um, whose turn is it? Oh, my own. Can you do number 12? 12. Imprisonment and the fortress of Maku. Sorry. The evil-minded prime minister prevented the Bob from seeing the king and arranged for the Bob to be imprisoned in the fortress in Maku, northwest of Persia. In his nine months in Maku, 1848, the Bab won the respect and admiration of his captors and the people, and he revealed the Persian Bayan, containing laws and principles of his dispensation, as well as the prophecies of his successor, he whom God shall make manifest." Unquote. So, you know, they're trying to send the Bab to the ends of the earth. You know, Maku, if you look at a map of uh, Persia, it's almost off the map, right? It's in that corner. And uh, some strange people live there. I mean, uh, you know, different tribal backgrounds and this and that. And so send him there. And he goes there. And the clergy are not sophisticated. They're not like the clergy in Tabriz or Isfahan or Tehran. So the clergy like him. And the people like him. And that's a pattern that happens both to the Bab and Baha'u'llah. That he, they're sent to prison or confinement in some way, and the people who are supposed to keep them persecuted and confined start to like them eventually, and they start to have influence, and they start to be given privileges, like, I'll let you have some visitors. I know you're supposed to be in prison, but I might let you have some visitors. Oh, you want to write something? Okay, I'll give you some paper and, and pens, things like that. Okay, so this is going to continue this pattern. Um, so, can you read 13? When the Bob is transferred to a remote fortress in Chihuahua, where he remained for most of the next two years, again living with Sephardi's captors, many of the clergy and most of the people, he was summoned to a meeting in Tabriz with many religious and government officials who attempted to humiliate the Bob, but the plans failed and he eloquently proclaimed, I am, I am, I am, the promised one. Followed by severe scourging and the beating of his feet, he was sent back to Jehu, where he remained until the final episode of his life in Tartus. 
You know, it talks about a meeting in Therese with many religious and government officials, a conference like that. And, and, and can, you, can you imagine, say, a room of 50 or 60 people who are uh, religious leaders and civic leaders, and they're trying to trip up the bar. They're trying to sh humiliate him, trying to show people he doesn't know what he's talking about. And he embarrasses them by knowing more about what he's talking about than they do. He knows the Quran better. He knows the Hadith and the sayings and the prophecies. He can explain all this stuff. This pattern is throughout the, uh, the founding of the Baha'i Faith, the pattern of being uh, encountered by a bunch of officials at once. To Tahare, I think, had seven of those meetings. Can you imagine seven meetings like that, where they're trying to show that she doesn't know something? And uh, meetings that Baha'u'llah had in various places, Baghdad and other places. Um, so it's another, those are tests. Those are tests where the leaders of the day, religiously and, and from a civic point of view, cannot trip them up. That's very frustrating to them. Okay, um, whose turn is it? We have, we have, look at page two of the handout. We have five more of these patterns or storylines or episodes. Um, oh yeah, please. Conference of Badash and Tahara's proclamation. Among the Bab's disciples was Tahara, a prophetess of the spiritual quality of women and men, who was a central figure at the Conference of Badash in 1848, where the independence of the Babi faith was dramatically proclaimed. The Bab and his disciples thought that the Islamic era was at an end, and that a new faith was at hand preparing humanity for the new day of God, a millennium during, during which humanity would achieve world unity. You see that word prophetess there? You see, the, I don't think you see that word in the Baha'i writings at all. But I believe a, a journalist who is hearing about uh, Tahare might jump to that conclusion. I want to say why. Because if you study Tahare, you would see that she knew things that were going to happen before they happened. What kind of a person knows what's going to happen before it happens? Somebody who sort of has a pipeline to the, the invisible world or the future? How, how do they know that, those things? Anyway, I, I'm just so that's why I threw that word in there. It's not that it's in the Baha'i writing, but a, a journalist might think of it that way. Um, now, let's jump to page five. I want to show you what I did. I, I have a, page five has a whole section here called Exemplary Woman. Tahare trumpets the new day of gender equality. You know, I, I, some of you know I wrote a book called uh, Founders of Faith. And that book says there's about 25 patterns that are in common to all the prophets, the, major, the, the founders of the major religion. One of the patterns is that... Uh, Around each prophet, there is a, a woman who is a nurturing figure and another woman who is an a advocate, a public advocate figure. For example, in Christianity, who, who's the very nurturing figure? The most nurturing figure in the story of Jesus, I would say, is Mother Mary. And then who is the public advocate? I would say Mary Magdalene. So uh, to... To my shock, it looks like you can, if you ask yourself uh, regarding the founders of all the faiths, what two women stand out in the story? You can ask yourself that question. It's very obvious right away, it seems to me. So it looks to me like um, the most nurturing figure in the Baha'i era, uh, or, or the founding of the Baha'i era, would probably be uh, Bahia Kanu. That's just my opinion. And then I would say the most assertive one is obviously Tahare, obviously. So that's so she, an exemplary woman, trumpets the new day of gender equality. And um, if you look down at the last two paragraphs of this section, there's a quote here from the Dawnbreakers. Um, I'm reading this. It, it said, it, you see, Tahare comes out unveiled. She's at a conference and there's 81 people there. How many of them are women? 
One. No, she's there. One woman and 80 men. Okay, something like that. And she comes out unveiled. You don't do this, do you? At that time, in that place, you don't come out unveiled. She comes out unveiled. Suddenly the figure of Tahare, adorned and unveiled, appeared before the eyes of the assembled companions. Her unruffled serenity sharply contrasted with the affrighted countenances of those who were gazing upon her. In language which bore a striking resemblance to that of the Quran, she delivered her appeal on breaking from Islam with matchless eloquence and profound fervor. I am the blast of the trumpet. I am the call of the bugle. I am the word which the Kaim is to utter, the word which shall put to flight the chiefs and nobles of the earth. So this is quoted in the Dawnbreakers. Anyway, very interesting. Then it goes on, um, the next paragraph describes that she goes to these conferences, Tahare, and she's, they, they're, they're throwing questions at her. And uh, she says at one point, when will you lift your eyes toward the Son of Truth? Shocked by her attitude, they sentenced her to death. As the hour approached, she boldly declared, you can kill me as soon as you wish, but you cannot stop the emancipation of women. You know, from an American point of view, and this is brought up in this book, this, in 1848, when the Conference of the Dash was happening, there was another conference going on in the U.S. in Seneca Falls, and there were women who were scholarly women there, and they were talking about the equality of women and how women should have the vote and they could transform the world. That was in 1848, about the same time as this was going on. So when she tells the story of Tahare at the Conference of Badash, she mentions that as just an interesting footnote to American or North American readers. Um, okay, and here... As I understand it, Tahare knew how she was going to die. She, she was preparing for it, and she had already described it somewhere. And uh, how do you do that? Unless you're some kind of a prophetess. That's what I mean by, there's more than that. There's other examples of her knowing things before they were revealed. Um, okay, so she's an interesting figure. That's just an example of how you can unpack one of the storylines. You know, you could spend your life studying Tahare, her poetry, her brilliant theology, her courage. Like she goes uh, to a wedding and then pretty soon no one's paying any attention to the wedding, they're paying attention to Tahare. Why? Her wisdom, her eloquence, her knowledge, her power, her courage. Okay, um, so she's a letter of the living. One, I think she's the only one that didn't see the Bob, never saw him. But that doesn't matter. She's a, a prophetess. <laughs> she knows. Okay. Um, what? Where are we? Oh, who? Who's there? Hold on. Can you do fifteen? Sure. Fifteen. And one page two again. Going back to the storyline. Yeah. <laughs> Persecution and heroic resistance. The Bob's followers were persecuted in unspeakable cruel, cruel ways, and about 20,000 were martyred in the first decade of the new cause. Among the most accomplished heroic leaders of the Bobby faith were two clergymen, Wahid and Hujat, and they, along with Mullah Hussein or Dukes, were the brave inspired leaders at three Bobby resistance battle at the fort of Sheikh Tabarsi and at the towns of Mayriz and Zanjan. So if, if you wanted to focus on heroic, you know, behavior or resistance, you could focus in on this storyline and break it up into a lot of other storylines. You, you could do that. Um, okay, 16. Uh, whose turn is it? Tabasong? Should we read that? In God told me the benefits. Unable to silence the Bob and powerless to halt the spread of his cause, the authorities decided to execute him. And the Bob sent Baha'u'llah a chest containing all of his writings, along with his pamphlets, pamphlet seals and rings, another sign of him, of who he regarded as his successor. The Bob referred to Baha'u'llah 
as he whom God shall make manifest, our promised deliverer, the crimson, all encompassing light, the author of the most mighty book. Okay, now, um, you see, look at the next one. This is the martyrdom of the Bob. You could spend your life studying this event and just using historical sources like uh, ambassadors or uh, uh, what do you call those figures from another country? Well, I guess they're ambassadors. Okay, their, their reports on what happened. Please, John. Well, who were these people who were organization that was persecuting him? The 20,000? Yeah, so the, the civic and religious leaders were lined up against the Bobbies. A lot of them, not all of them, but a great so many of them. Oh, well, this is called the Bobby faith at this point. So the the followers of the Bob were called Bobbies. So this is, a, you could call it a little 19-year religion, 19-year religious dispensation, or you could call it the getting ready for, for the Baha'i faith. So, am I getting at what you're well, asking? I'm wondering who was persecuting them. Is it Shia Muslim clergy and and the and the uh, civic leaders who they could persuade governors. Oh, that prime minister, he was really bad. You know, in my book, I took this and I I circled in red the antagonists of the faith. You know, you see this. You know, journalists like to tell stories, and a story means you have protagonists and antagonists. And you could tell the story again from the antagonist point of view. That, that is possible, right? A story can be told from many different points of view. There's a famous Japanese movie where they tell the same story from five different points of view. Well, so, but the journalist who's trying to understand the Bobbies and the, and the birth of the Baha'i faith would take, they would see the Bobbies as the protagonist and the ones who are persecuting him as the antagonist. But stories can be told in different ways. Um, before we go into this, can you look at page six? I want to show you something at the bottom of page six. Our titles. Uh, th this is something uh, that's a little bit hard for Westerners to understand. All these titles, like, you know, in other words, you know what my first take on Persian was as a language? I said, it's flowery. It's, it's almost too flowery. There's too much uh, metaphors in there. I get lost. You see, now, now this, this challenge for Westerners, I'm not saying it's a bad quality. Now I appreciate it. It took me 20 years, but I finally appreciate it. This shows up in the titles for the same figure, the Bob, and then the and Baha'u'llah, titles. Look, the Bob described himself as the gate of the glory of God, the Kaim, the, or the return of the hidden Imam, the Lord of the age, the bringer of the day of renewal, the res, the bringer of the the day of resurrection, and the bringer of the return and the balance. And that's just some of them. You see, but when you're first studying this, you can get a headache very quickly. Look at all those titles. But each title tells you a little bit more. <laughs> so here, I'm going on. Baha'u'llah talked about the Bab too. Baha'u'llah described the Bab as the point around whom the realities of the prophets revolve. Wow. The primal point from which have been generated all created things. See, this is talking about a manifestation and the, the power they have. And it's also saying that the Bob is sort of at the end of this big era called the cycle of prophecy. And, that, and then he's launching through Baha'u'llah the, another long cycle called the cycle of fulfillment. He's the point between these two long cycles. Oh my God. The inheritor of the earth and all that is therein. The countenance of God whose splendor can never be obscured. The light of God whose radiance can never fade. And this is only some of them. I stopped because I didn't want to give myself a worse headache from all these titles. Then Abdu'l Baha described the Bab as the illustrious being who shook the foundations of Persia, the proclaimer of the glad tidings. You see that 
glad tidings, that means gospel. It means good news. The proclaimer of the glad tidings of the son of Baha, the son of glory, the hastener to the field of martyrdom, the universal educator laying the foundations of progress. Now, the guardian, this is the grandson of Akbar, he used phrases like this, the center of a galaxy of God-intoxicated heroes. I actually like the guardian. You know, his, you know why his language? He studied English. <laughs> he studied English and he mastered it. So he comes up with phrases that blow me away. And I think I understand them. He, he says, uh, the Bob is the fountainhead from whence the vitalizing energies of a newborn revelation flowed. The promised one of Islam, the first trumpet blast of the new age, the forerunner of the new day of God, the herald of one immeasurably greater than himself. So all of these titles uh, say something a little bit different about the, the importance, the, the station. So I think they're describing the station and the historical significance of, of the Bob. So if the bicentenary is to bring up the significance of the Bab and Baha'u'llah, Baha'u'llah especially, then these titles matter, right? They're, they're a clue to some of the significance. And I remember when I was studying this, I was trying to get all of the titles. I gave up. There's, there's too many of them. I gave up. I thought it was like the 99 names of God and there was going to be a finite number of them and then I could quit and say, I found them all and I, I, you can't do it. At least I, I can. But these are some of them. Okay, but this is a stumbling block for Westerners who are, who are used to, for example, Jesus, you might say, well, he's the Savior. He's the Son of God. And I quit. That's it. You see what I mean? Just, just two titles the Savior, and the Son of God. But then you might say, he's a, he's a third member of the Trinity. You could come up with more. But there's a, there's a but maybe you can count them on one hand. But this is, please. Oh, thank you. Son of Man. See, there's a few more. Maybe if you studied the New Testament, you'd get 12 of them. But you wouldn't get 100 of them. <laughs> You know, or whatever you get from the Persian writings, it's just a, a staggering number. Please. Uh, can it be because of many religions before Bob and Baha'u'llah has a promise of some certain title? So all these titles differences point directly to that promise one that is... That's clever. That That's a very good hypothesis. You mean, if you're trying to appeal to people from all traditions, you better have a lot of titles because they might just recognize one of them. They, ah, that's it. I like that one. And that one makes sense to me. It makes sense to a Hindu or to a Buddhist or a Zartushti, Zoroastrian or something. You know, make, that's an interesting idea. That must be why. You know, on my chart, I had names of the promised day. That's another one that has a lot of names. Each tradition has several names and then... Oh my God, how many names would there be for the promised day in the Baha'i writings? I, I, I get a headache just thinking about it. Um, okay, let's go back to what we were doing and then we'll take a break. And, and you know, he quotes these short hadith, uh, uh, William Sears, a lot. Here's another one. At the very hour that the Bob was slain, oh, oh, this is not a hadith. This is what he says. Okay, he says, at the very hour that the Bob was slain, a whirlwind of dust of incredible density obscured the light of the sun and blinded the eyes of the people who remained wrapped in fearful darkness from noon until night. Does that sound familiar to anyone? The people who know Christian story, they know that it got dark after Jesus was crucified. I mean, that's the story. And then here's another line. This is from Amos, way back. This is in the Old Testament. So this was about 2,700 years ago. Amos said, I will, I, speaking for God, I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. Is it, so God is warning humanity some things he's going to do in the future. Um, 
You know, at those 750 soldiers that shot the bomb the second time, you know, and killed him uh, and Anis, I, I think I heard the story that uh, there was an earthquake or something and a whole wall collapsed on those soldiers. 750 of them died in one swell poop. See? Ooh. So, now, that's a story that's part of this other story. Uh, here's another one. Um, uh, the Bob said something like, Would that I might be entombed within the precincts of the holy ground of my beloved. The Bob said that. Who's his beloved? I think he's talking about Baha'u'llah. So he's saying, take my ashes, <laughs> or no, take my remains to wherever my beloved ends up. Well, that, that mattered to Bobby's, and it mattered to early Baha'is to do that. That's not easy to do. Take the remains of someone, and how far is it from uh, Tabriz to northern Israel? That, that would be a real problem, to get it there. And, you know. Okay, but the early Baha'is did this. All right, uh, I'm just saying, see, this story, you could unpack lots of little dimensions. When I first read this story, when I was a Unitarian minister, I'm just reading the story, and I go, wait a second, this is too miraculous. How could the 750 bullets miss? And then when they kill him, why is his face so, you know, pure? And, uh, and how could the sun get dark, you know, at that time? And, and yet, if there's all these people watching and recording, sophisticated international diplomats, they, they wouldn't have any reason to distort the story. They, they saw it. Something like that happened. But I don't know how the physics of it. And then the Bob saying things like, uh, uh, well, you know, I'm not done. As soon as I am done, you can kill me, but not until then. You know, isn't that amazing? What, what kind of an utterance is that? Does he have the power to suspend the laws of physics? Uh, anyway, so, but it raises those questions. But I don't think Baha'is want people to believe anything because of miracles. It, 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 as I, in fact, that's how I understand all the other religions, too. The founders of the religions downplayed miracles, didn't want that to be the reason. What should be the reason? The reason should be something like, you believe the story, and you believe the revealed guidance coming out of the story. Those are the real truths. Uh, anyway, that's my interpretation of the founders of major religions. They could perform miracles, but they didn't want to emphasize it. There's a story about the Buddha who says to his disciples, uh, you know, you're, you're starting to develop some new powers. Have you noticed that? And he says, but I don't want you to use them to impress people. You can use these powers to uh, bring about awareness and compassion but don't use it just to show off. You're, I'm, I'm translating, you see. Please, please. Science. One of those 750 bullets broke the rope, the rope yes. falls. And then the other one. one I, 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 but what makes it look like the, the Bob is powerful yeah. is he says, I wasn't finished. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, that just not blew me away. You know, I wasn't finished. Now I'm finished. And you, anyway, uh, okay. So, and then one last storyline, and then we have to take a break. Sorry to make you suffer so long here. Okay. The last one, preparing the world for Baha'u'llah. So this is like a summary. Just let me read this. The Bob gave his life to prepare the way for Baha'u'llah, the glory of God. So this is the, the Baha'i explanation for all this. Summary. The glory of God, whose cause of universal peace is destined to spread all over the world and to usher in the spiritual maturation of humanity, 
never advance a global civilization and the most great peace. So the whole uh, ministry and message of the Bible is being interpreted primarily as getting ready, a preparation. Whereas you could study 27 volumes of the Bob's writings as a new religion which, with implications for the future. And someday all of that will be published and uh, integrated, perhaps. Okay, but the Baha'i version of the story is that he's preparatory. He's preparatory. This sacrifice is necessary. Going back, one more thing, and then you have to have a break. Sorry. You know, the Conference of the Dasht wanted to clarify that the Babi faith was not a reform movement within Islam. That it was bringing, it was the culmination of Islam and preparing for a new book. Speaking of that, here is another, here's another hadith. Quick, uh, should, Muhammad said this supposedly, okay? Should a youth from my <coughs> tribe, Muhammad's tribe, summon the people to a new book and to new laws, all should hasten to him and embrace his cause. See, Muhammad said that, you know, the authentic hadith are six volumes, and this is some of them, and he's the one who catches the short ones. That's why I like him, see. He's a journalist. There's some hadith that are so long and complicated you'll get lost. But some are very quick and clear. This one is saying, someone's going to come along with a new book. This doesn't mean any old book. It's the book, capital B, a book of God, a new laws. If that happens, follow him. See, this is part of a Baha'i Muslim dialogue. There are authentic hadith that point to a new faith coming. Um, and, you, and so it's a critique of this a rigid interpretation of the uh, Muhammad, uh, uh, Muhammad being the seal of the prophets, if by that you mean the last one, never again another one. There's a lot of things in the Quran and the Hadith that suggest otherwise. I, you know, the prophecy is a really complex thing. Um, basically, you know, here's an analogy. Uh, just learning about the teachings of the founders, that you could call that arithmetic. And studying the stories of the founders, that's like algebra. And studying prophecies is like uh, trigonometry or something like that. Or, or, you know what I mean? Some higher math. It's, it's more complicated, I, I believe. But each faith has a way of interpreting prophecies. <coughs> And, uh, you know, it, it, in some future dispensation, you know, a thousand years or more away, um, a lot of the prophecies will look like they're pointing to another manifestation. So prophecies can, can point to one specific manifestation, or sometimes they're so general they can point to a, a series of them. You know, okay, so for example, look at this one here. Uh, the second one, the government will be upon his shoulder. This is Isaiah, first Isaiah, in other words, uh, 2,700 years ago. The government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. So, to Christian ears, this sounds like it's talking about Jesus. To Muslim ears, it sounds like it's talking about Muhammad. You know, a, a Muslim might say, well, you know, Jesus didn't really reveal a bunch of laws. He didn't, he didn't create a government, whereas Muhammad did. <laughs> so you see what I mean? So they, they might say this, this prophecy points to Muhammad. And then Baha'is would say, no, this points to Baha'u'llah. And you might say, well, has, Baha has the Baha'i faith created a world government yet? No. So you see, you have to be patient with prophecies. They, they may be talking about a specific event, or they may be talking about a development that goes over centuries. Um, 
look under the next set of Christian prophecies. The counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. That's Jesus talking. Whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I, Jesus, have said to you. So uh, Christians say, well, that's talking about the Holy Spirit or talking about the church. It's prophesied. Jesus is talking about the power of the church in the future. And Muslims say that's talking about Muhammad. To Baha'is, it looks like it's talking about Baha'u'llah. And maybe it, it, in another dispensation, another religion in the future, it will look like it's talking about that figure. See? So you can... That's why people should be a little bit humble about prophecy interpretation. Someday, I think there's going to be conferences where they talk calmly about this and try to crack the code, you know? Okay, and then... But some of these Muslim ones are really amazing. Uh, the two trumpets. You see, that's below the third line there on page three. The trumpet will just be sounded when all that are in the heavens and the earth will swoon. And then a second one will be sounded when, behold, they will be standing and looking on and the earth will shine with the glory of its Lord. See that word glory looks like it's pointing to Baha'u'llah. So that looks like it's referring to the Bab and Baha'u'llah to Baha'i ears. Some of these... Uh, can I ask Tawasum, can you read that long hadith on page 4? It, it, it's near the top of page 4. It says, the imam who will create a world state. Wow. Yes, please. The Imam who will create a world state will bring support to humanity. That means help to humanity. Okay, yeah. He will take out the hidden wealth from the breast of the earth and will distribute it equitably amongst the needy deserving. He will teach you simple living and high thinking. He will make you understand that virtue is, virtue is a mean between two extremes. He will revive the teachings of the Holy Quran. He will protect and defend himself with resources of science and knowledge. He will establish an empire of God in this world. He will be the final demonstration and proof of God's merciful wish to acquaint men with the right ways of life. You know, so this is supposedly came from a sermon or a talk that Muhammad gave late in his ministry, like in maybe the year 630 maybe two years before he died, or maybe one year, or anyway, someone may know more details about that. But isn't that an amazing statement? There's going to be an imam or religious leader who will create a world state? A world state? You know, the, there hasn't... You know, you remember Alexander the Great? The supposed, the, or the, I think the Persians call him Alexander the Accursed. But he had in mind a world state, too. There's never been a world state. And this is saying, there's going to be a world state. <laughs> and, it, and this leader, this teacher, is going to revive the teachings of the Holy Quran, and he's going to teach that virtue is a mean between, in other words, moderation. Plus, that's a direct quote almost from Aristotle, but it's even earlier in the Zoroastrian writings about virtue is a mean between extremes. Uh, so this is amazing quote. Long, And I shortened it. He's going to defend himself with resources of science and knowledge. So quite, quite amazing. And oh, look at that one about take out the hidden wealth from the breast of the earth and will distribute it equitably among the needy deserving. That would be pretty good. That would solve economic problems globally. Wipe out poverty. Anyway, I'm just saying, this is just a, 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 like a sermon of a hadith, or it wasn't uh, in the, it's not in the Quran, but supposedly coming right from Muhammad about the future. Okay, I want to show you on page four, right below this, you see there's a quote from the Bob that he's talking to his uh, Letters of the Living. And I want to read part of this. Let your light shine before the eyes of men. Do you see where I'm reading? One third of the way down on page four. Let your light shine before the eyes of men into whatever city you enter. 
proclaim and teach the cause of God. You are the witnesses of the dawn of the promised day of God. You are the partakers of the mystic chalice of his revelation. Remember I mentioned the mystic chalice earlier? That could be a, a you could translate that holy grail. That's, I think, why, you know, William Sears begins this book with that sentence about the search for the holy grail or the mystic chalice or the cup of divine guidance that will heal the world. Uh, quite amazing. And the next paragraph talks about, you know, the Bob uh, being interviewed by those aggressive mullahs and him saying, I am, I am, I am the promised one. And the, the rest, some of the rest of that quote, I am the one whose name you have for a thousand years evoked. It is incumbent upon the peoples of the East and the West to obey my word and to pledge allegiance to my person. You know, if you were somebody just playing politics, you wouldn't say such a thing to those people because you'd be killed. <laughs> You're going to anger them by saying such a thing. So, in other words, the early Bobbies, including the Bob, say things that evoke reaction. Uh, they know they're going to be sacrificed for some larger cause. Uh, you know, it, 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 this happens before. You know, Christians go into a coliseum with lions, unafraid, and that impressed the Romans. Martyrdom is uh, very impressive to people that observe it. They say, what makes people make such a sacrifice? They must know something I don't know. Um, so, okay. Um, I, any observations, questions, comments, complaints about, about what we've done? I hope what I'm, my method is making sense to you. You don't have to agree with it, but I'm emphasizing these stories. Because normally I don't teach this way. I, always, I like to talk about progressive revelation and high, you know, theological concepts and comparing religions and prophecy interpretation. But I think I've been missing the gospel or the short good news of the Baha'i faith. And I think that the bicentenary requires us to get better at that. So this was my attempt to begin, you know, learning for myself. There might be a better way to do it. I'm sure somebody out there, you know, among many Baha'is has narrative intelligence. Yeah, I should ask my wife to do this, but what are the storylines of, like this lady came up with 69 of them for Baha'u'llah. And if, if you read this book, you, you might have your own way of naming the story. She gives it a name, but you might have another name that helps you remember that story. And you might have favorite stories. Favorite stories, that's really important because you, you can tell them with a lot of power. They're your favorite. You feel like you actually were there. <laughs> so that's what I'm trying to do. You know, I discovered what I was trying to do. I went to this uh, conference for ABS, Abbas, what is it? No, not Abbas. Association. Association for Baha'i Studies. Okay. So what I was there, do what I was talking to a breakout session, about this many people, and I was telling them my attempt to design this course and what do I, what, what do I think, what do I think I'm learning so far? And one lady, a young lady who's uh, going to get a PhD in education, she says, are you trying to uh, build capacity for storytelling about the Baha'i faith? And I go, <laughs> see, that's, it. that's exactly, I didn't know what I was trying to do. But see, the question was better than anything I, I could say. I said, thank you. Yes, that's what I'm trying to do. Now, that's for Baha'is. I want Baha'is to expand their storytelling capacity. For non-Baha'is or friends of the Baha'i faith or people interested, I want them to get a sense of there is a story. And it's not impossible to learn it. I think many people assume it's not impossible. When they start reading about the Baha'i story, it's it, they get, that's it, it's too complicated. Life is too short. I can't learn that story. I can't even pronounce the name of the founder. So a journalist is someone that tries to simplify so that people get it and they want to research more. They want to do their own investigation. Questions, comments about what we're doing?
Please. Yeah. You mentioned at the beginning of the class tonight that I don't know if it was your interpretation or understanding that until and unless there is a king, a public defender of, let's say, a religion, let's say Christianity that was seen as a branch of Judaism at the beginning, and Baha'i faith was seen as continuation of Shia Islam for, for a long time, even now at least. So you're saying that we have to have a Constantinople type monarch who would come yeah. and release well, until we are recognized as an independent religion? That's a theory. It's a Herald's theory only. Okay. That, that we will get on the map of history, we Baha'i faith, when there is a monarch who begins to unite the nations under uh, new divine guidance or universal principles. Uh, before that, people will say, Baha'i faith is sort of an offshoot of Islam. I, I mean, here's the things I've heard about the Baha'i faith from people. They say, it's sort of like cleaned up Islam. <laughs> I, heard, I heard someone say that. It's a cleaned up version of Islam. I heard someone else say uh, it's a syncretistic religion. The syncretistic means uh, you're sort of picking the, the things you like from all, the menu, the smorgasbord of all the world. And you pick and choose whatever you like and you put it all together and it's a syncretistic. For example, the Dalai Lama, you know, he's a normally, he's a very wise man, generally. He says, you know, uh, the Baha'i faith is syncretistic. And therefore he dismisses it. He has more respect for the real religions. That is, they have an historical beginning, a middle, and uh, they develop. See? He doesn't know. See, <laughs> I'd love to talk to the Dalai Lama and say, I used to think, it, I thought it was syncretistic. For about five years, I thought, this is syncretistic. And some people like syncretism. You know, when Christianity go, went to... Uh, like, say, South America, it started to combine a little bit with the cultures there. You know, Christmas is a kind of a combination of uh, Germany, mm -hmm. things in Germany, and... and, and pagan. See, yeah, pagan, it's a mixture. So, uh, so some people think syncretism's good. Like, when Christianity went to Ireland, it picked up a Celtic flavor. You know, and they think that's good because it adapted itself to different parts of the world. So some, some scholars say syncretism is good or natural. And others say, oh, it's artificial. You know, for example, some people say the Sikh faith is syncretistic because Nanak, he combined things that uh, are Hindu and, and things that are Muslim. Right? And then added some other things. And so it looked like he was being syncretist. Maybe he was. Maybe what? But I'm just saying, and then some people would say, oh, the Baha'i faith is trying to compromise with science. So it's, it's trying to say science and religion are, it's trying to appeal to the modern mind. So it's a, it's a calculated effort to appeal to the modern mind. These are, all, these are some of the ways the Baha'i faith is looked at. So um, this is trying to say, well, it's a religion. You know, I have a friend, this is a true story, brief, but he, he, I was a Unitarian minister for 25 years. This guy was a Unitarian minister. He finally took this course, a version of this course in Langley. And then near the end, he said, you know, I'm discovering that the Baha'i faith is a religion. And I said, what did you think it was? <laughs> and he said, I thought... Again, syncretism. He didn't use that word. I, he thought it was a synthesis of various, uh, the most modern parts of other religions. And I knew this guy, and we had played golf and had a lot of conversations, but he still thought of it as that. So this convinced me it's not so easy to convey a new religion. Because people think of religion as full of bad things and some good things, mostly bad. Corruption, superstition, uh, sectarianism, the theological doctrines that are rigid, uh, you know. Um, so to convey 
the idea that all the religions were authentic in the beginning before they got tampered with too much by human beings that have big egos. <laughs> That's not easy to convey that and to, to demonstrate that. It's hard to do. Other comments about what we've done so far? I have a question. Please. You said that you used to think that Baha'i faith is syncretistic. Oh, what made you change your mind? That's a very good question. Here's a brief answer. Um, I, the station of Baha'u'llah, see, I, discovering what I thought was his station. See, I, I thought that Baha'u'llah was just clever. And ba Abdul Baha was clever too. Bob was clever. And they were saying good things. And the, I was learning enough history to know that Baha'u'llah never had a chance to sit down at a desk and write something. And I go, what? All this stuff is just coming out fast? You know, so a sense of a different station. Because, see, as a minister, you have to write things. And I can write one good sentence, but it might take me an hour. <laughs> so how can you rattle out long, long passages that are eloquent and beautiful and profound when you're in prison or when you're under persecution? See, I started to sense, oh, I think he is a, a higher station. He's a prophet. <clears throat> this is divine guidance coming through him. Anyway, along that line, then if that was the case, I said, oh, then it's a religion. It's not syncretism. It's, it's another religion coming into birth that has application to many aspects of humanity because we're modern and we have this thing called the, the Internet that connects the world. It's now possible to create a global civilization. I had always aspired to something like that without believing it was possible. I thought it's a good idea. But human beings are not uh, moral and spiritual enough to do it. And now I think, but under divine guidance, we can grow into it over a couple of hundred years. Who knows when we'll start to see uh, signs that humanity is really maturing. Okay, other questions, comments about all of this? Briefly, well, no, that's too long a story, but I was a Unitarian minister for 25 years. But for the last 10 years, I was uh, somebody, uh, Sandra Zizi, some of you know her. She, she passed away, but she was an auxiliary. She was one of the first teachers I had. Anyway, I started to read Baha'i books about once a week, one book a week, or at least one every two weeks and started to integrate it with what I already thought I understood. And so, you know, it was a 10-year process. Anyway, that, that's what happened. And I'm an interfaith diplomat, so I was trying to look how, how can the religions respect each other. Well, this is the ultimate way to, to say the religions should respect each other. If they all came from the same God, same one source. Um, so that, that looked like... I was doing, a, I, I had something called respect for diversity. That, that was my main motto. And then under the Baha'i influence, I started to substitute unity in diversity. Okay? Respect for diversity sort of implies we'll never, we'll never unite, but we can respect each other, and that's good. But then my goal started to shift. Unity is possible if humanity is maturing. Um, so, along that line. Yeah, other comments, questions? I, I hope you're going to get inspired to write better versions of these storylines. Like, if, you, if this were a real class, I would assign you. Come up with your own version of the storylines. Give me the names and write the first two sentences of the article that was be written by that journalist. And I'm sure they'd be varied, be, very, be different. But if that's something like that's necessary. Because Christians know the storylines of Jesus. And, and Muslims know the storylines of the story of Muhammad. They can tell you. And Baha'is, uh, we start to flop all over the place in, in telling the story. And there's, so, and there's good reasons why that's hard. But this is a, an attempt to start to identify the pieces or possible pieces.
for a new chapter in the book of religions. New chapter. Anything else? Comments, questions? It's really intimidating to talk to a, such a big class. See, he's in a little class of five, and nobody has trouble talking in a but little group had of five. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I brought $36 worth of refreshments. <laughs> I ate most of them. For five people. Thank you. I'm not going to do that again. Expensive. Please, please. Uh, I have a client. Uh, she uh, on the Sundays she goes to church and talk. And every time she was coming to me, she was brought uh, a passage of Jesus Christ and feel good. One day I give her you know, the promise one book <laughs> to her, and as soon as she saw it, you know. Um, page. She said, oh yeah, I can't read. Yeah. <laughs> I can't see. <laughs> My eyes. Excuse me, your passage is very, very tiny and <laughs> the line is very narrow. <laughs> you can read that. This one is no bigger one. But I just, uh, my question is that how we can, um, you know, some of the people who are really religious, they don't want to even talk about it. Even when like, they say we are Baha'i, they uh, change the subject and they don't want to talk. Of course, we saw these things in Iran. Yeah. But I, I thought you were priest and you were... You know, yeah. Talking. Well, you know, uh, th this is a bigger and bigger challenge because about 25 or 30 percent of the world is not religious. And some of them are spiritual but not religious. They say that. That's a new category, spiritual but not... Some are just not religious and they're anti-religious. Mm -hmm. Not only are they not religious, they don't... They think it's a bad thing. So... Um, I'm not saying I have any magic on that. I, would I you see? But I, in my old church, there were a lot of liberal-minded people, so, and so what I try to do is emphasize what universal principles are needed for humanity to make a make a better world. And uh, see, that's a question that's neutral, right? And a lot of people, well. The Baha'i interpretation is everyone has a soul or a part of us that's aware of higher reality. But some people say don't believe in a soul, only in the brain. But you can still talk to them about universal principles. I have a friend, uh, a woman who's a lawyer in Portland, Oregon, and she doesn't believe in God or religion. She's Jewish background. But one day we were talking about justice, and I, I know for her... Justice is extremely important. And one day I asked her, I said, do you think justice is something made up by human beings entirely? Or does it have some kind of existence all by itself? And she thought about that and says, no, justice is objective. It exists independent of whether people uh, can see it. And she's a mediator. She loves to solve problems with what Baha'is call consultation. So I told her, I said, okay, so the word justice and the concept of justice is serving like God for you. It, it is transcendent. You are shaping your behavior according to justice as you understand it. I said, I, I said you probably don't, wouldn't accept this interpretation, but justice is a, like a transcendent divine for you. So that's an, a, a kind of strategy. If we can find virtues... That's, that are important for people, like wisdom and love and responsibility. There, many people do a lot of good deeds, and, but they don't believe in religion. So for them, service is a, a very important concept. Um, anyway, that's a strategy. Virtues, education, is a strategy. And the more deeply people go into virtues or universal principles, that at some point they say, they might be aware that we didn't in invent this. This, this has some kind of objective reality. And then that introduces higher levels of reality. So, I don't know. But, uh, there are different strategies. How do you take someone who's interested in spiritual things but doesn't believe in religion? So, for them, religion is corrupt. Mm -hmm. By definition, it's like prison. <laughs> and then my strategy for them is to say, can you just one soul at a time transform the whole world? And, you know, in other words, uh, do you, religion is big. 
it's not just a little spiritual group. It, it ends. It goes across cultures and has institutions and laws. So how do you change the world? It takes more than spiritual awareness. It takes institutions, laws. It, it, human beings are more than just uh, individuals. We're communities, nations, a world community. Institutions are... See, that word is, means, is bad for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It was that way for me. I don't want to live in an institution. Organized religion. Yeah, or, right. But see, what if an institution actually were consultative? I, I, you can ask that question. Is it possible to have a just institution? An institution that learns and changes along that line. I don't have all the answers. I'm just, you know, these are groping around possibilities for different kinds of people. Are, are they, any, you have answers to these good questions that are coming up? Anybody? Please. I guess we have to be happy for the problems that is happening in this world. Because that brings consciousness, that brings awareness and search. Problems are good? All that bad news is good. <laughs> it clarifies what direction to go, doesn't it? Is good. Yeah. Yeah. Good Bye. Bye. <clears throat> Very good. We almost we finished what I had in mind and then some. I can't believe it. That's amazing. I want to get you ready for next week. So the next three sessions are all about Baha'u'llah. This was just a warm-up exercise. So Except it's going to start with the birth of Baha'u'llah. So we'll take Baha'u'llah from 1817 to 1863. Wow! That's a long piece of time. And, and, and you know, during that time, he's supporting the Bobby cause. And then 1863 comes, and, you know, he declares he's the one who the Bob was getting people ready for. And uh, very few people were surprised by that time. Anyway, we look at that story. And again... You could break that story up into a lot of pieces, and I'm just going to, we're going to look at about 11 of them. And see, that's how I'm naming them, and you can see what how you would name them. She breaks Baha'u'llah's story into 69 pieces, <laughs> all four or five pages. This is a story? This is a, a novel. This is a, there's a name for this genre where you try to write a novel, but it's true. Like she did all this research and uh, all the quotes are accurate. Took her 16 years to write this. Oh. She's Baha'i? The she, title of the book is it? The story of Baha'u'llah promised one of all ages. But it's a novel. See, it's, it's written like a novel. You know how novels set the scene and tell you what it smells like in the marketplace and things like that and who did what to whom and da 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 and she, she digs into women. She extra research on the to make it a more full story. Because you know, if you this book has how many women in it? One. Tare. <laughs> you see, this one has a lot of women in it. A whole lot. So uh, I got to go to a workshop with her, and I was fascinated. She said she would have never survived this project had she not met a group of people that were writing. Every week they would share some of their writing. And um, the power of stories. How do you pronounce her name? What's that? How do you pronounce the name? Druzel Cedarquist. Druzel. Drew, she calls herself. Drew. D-R-U. Is it Spanish? No, I don't think so. There she is right here. She doesn't look very Spanish. She's not, she's not Spanish. She's a writer and poet. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the last session will be looking at uh, Abdul Baha and the Guardian in one session. And a little bit about the Universal House of Justice. But remember, we're mainly trying to introduce Baha'u'llah, the forerunner and Baha'u'llah, but to show that there was uh, institutions were set up and a successor was clarified to build the world. It's one thing to have all these ideals, and another to have an institutional machinery to, to start to implement it. So that's what uh, that last session is supposed to 
show and invite people to investigate further. And again, I said last week, this was an experiment. Could I teach one of my kind of courses as a play about the Baha'i faith? I've been teaching six sessions. Like John, you know that the, you know, the courses at the uh, Simon Fraser University program, there's six sessions. There's a six is a magic number. Because people his age, they won't take a class longer than that. <laughs> they have a you know a honeymoon or, or no I think they have a vacation in mind or something, yeah. and, and they're but they're two hours, so it's substantial, six two hour sessions. So if I I tried to cut you know what can we, what can you teach in twelve hours about the the Baha'i faith? It's bounding, and so that that's the experiment. Can you do that? I found out there are some people that designed an eighteen session course on the Baha'i faith public. 18 two-hour sessions, and other people have just four sessions on the Baha'i faith, and uh, there's all different sizes, all different sizes. So this is my, what I've discovered that since I'm an adult uh, community educator, I'm working in six sessions. <laughs> so this is my attempt to do the Baha'i faith in six sessions. Okay, thank you for hanging in so long. Thank you.